<laughs> cool. Thanks, Brendan. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. As he said, I'm MC Owens. And uh, tonight, uh, so we're continuing our study of the uh, Manjushri's Pure Land Sutra, just to put it briefly. Um, we're only going to read a little bit more of it because I have a theme, a new theme for tonight. And so I thought tonight would be a good night to discuss everybody's favorite topic, which is the topic of no self. Topic comes up a lot. Obviously, it's kind of the foundation of Dharma, foundation of Buddha Dharma, I would say. Um, and so we're going to spend all tonight talking about this very, very important Buddhist concept. This the reason for this is at the end of last uh, week's Dharma Doors, Noe, who's in the audience, asked a great question, as Noe often does. And to just to the, the degree to which I remember exactly what you said, Noe, just to summarize, please jump in if I get this wrong. But the basic idea, and it's, an, it's a question that comes up a lot. If there's no self, and therefore as well, no selves, meaning no others, no self, <laughs> why bother with all, then what, you know, why bother, but also just, it sort of raises this very, very, very big question. And so Noe, I answered you last week, you know, as I often do, just, you know, whatever comes into my head generally is what comes out of the mouth. And what I answered you was about, or at least I, cause we were at the very end of the, the evening, I happened to mention, well, this has a lot to do with why the Mahayana sutras are always encouraging the Bodhisattva path and not the path of voice hearers or solitary enlightened ones. So not the path of Shravakas and Pratyekya Buddhas, but the path of the Bodhisattva. And what's interesting is that, just to bring you up to speed, I had completely forgotten <laughs> that the very next instruction in our sutra, the Buddha tells Shariputra, remember Shariputra is our main inter, interlocutor, right? Our main uh, question asker. And Shariputra, or the Buddha tells Shariputra, additionally, a bodhisattva has two qualities to their aspiration for enlightenment. And those two are that the bodhisattva should not yearn for the way of the voice hearer. <laughs> and should also not encourage others to pursue the way of the voice hearer. And just summarizing really quickly, the second quality is to not yearn for the way of a solitary enlightened one or a Pratyakya Buddha, and also not to encourage others to pursue that path either. So clearly kind of my thinking was right in line with the sutra in that way that that was sort of, you know, um, a, a relevant thing to bring up. But again, that sort of that question and really, you know, really recognizing and appreciating that it's an important question, which is if there's no self, if there's no others, what's going on here? Kind of what's the point? And because this teaching of no self is so important to Buddha Dharma, I'm going to spend all night on this. But what we're going to do is, and tonight might be, you know, and I don't say this often, but tonight might be a little heavy. There's going to be a lot of ideas, and they're going to keep building and building and building. So to begin with, just to give you a, a preview of what's going to happen, I'm going to talk about this idea of no self in three different ways. And these three different ways can be thought of as mm, corresponding to something that is usually called the three turnings of the Dharma wheel. And this is a pretty standard Buddhist thing to talk about, which is this idea that 
the Buddha sort of rolled out the teachings in stages, stage one, stage two, and stage three, that sort of correspond to the path of the voice hearer, the path of the Pratakya Buddha, and the path of the Bodhisattva. Hinayana, Madhyamaka maybe, if you're familiar with that early philosophical school of Buddhism, and then Mahayana. Now, if you're really familiar already with the, this idea of the three turnings of the Dharma wheel, you probably think of it as Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, that the Vajra path is the third turning. You could also think of the three turnings simply as early Buddhism, middle period Buddhism, and late Buddhism. My point is, is that although I'm going to talk about what no self means to a Hinayanaist, to a Shravaka, and I'm going to talk about what self, no self means to a Pratekya Buddha, I'm going to talk about what no self means to a Bodhisattva. I am not, nor does any of, the, or of these traditions, I'm not putting these as three different options. It, these are not against each other as like, well, they say it's this, but they say it's this, and they say it's that. Tonight, I because I want you to kind of really uh, appreciate the evolution of this idea. So we're doing a genealogy or a kind of evolution of this idea. And so it's not that these are three different views. It's that the first one is going to be a very basic introduction to this idea of no self but it's going to be very complicated but then basically we're going to go deeper and then we're going to go really deep into this teaching of no self and if i'm successful i hope that at the end of this you'll see or perhaps you will think those are but those are all the same those are saying the same thing <laughs> If so, if I do my job right, you'll say, but those are saying the same thing, because in my opinion, they are, but there's slight nuanced differences. And this will all arc toward a better answer to Noe's question about <laughs> why, why to do any of this in that way. So, so those are the stages or those are the, the movements tonight. The first thing, so we're going to talk about the original idea of no self this original teaching of the Buddha, and we're going to talk about it as it is, a, a, you know, taught in that original school, basically corresponding to the Theravada kind of tradition or something to that effect in the modern world. So the thing is, is that normally when we talk about no self, the word that is normally being referred to in Pali would be anatta. Anatman in Sanskrit or Anatta in Pali, but we're actually going to talk about three different words uh, for this first part. Anatta, no self, but it's no Atman. And I'm going to clarify what that means. Then we're going to talk about something called the uh, Sakkaya, or in Sanskrit, Satkaya. I'll explain what that is in a second. And then we're going to talk about a word called mana that's related to a word called manas, but it's mana. So those are the three words that are kind of technical terms. They're all used a little interchangeably, but they actually have pretty technical differences to them that I'm going to try to spell out. So let's begin with the, it's actually kind of the easiest in my opinion. So Oh, and by the way, as usual, a huge caveat and warning that I am, of course, grossly overgeneralizing everything. <laughs> it's just ridiculous summaries. Okay, so respect. <laughs> but anatta, which has a lot of different interpretations, it is usually no self, but as I mentioned, the kind of the root of it is this idea of anatman, no atman. And the thing about an Atman is that even though nine times out of 10, this will be translated as no self, 
sometimes it's translated as no soul or no essence. And that actually gets a little closer to what anatman or anatta sort of can mean. I don't want to say it's what it means, but it can mean no essence or no soul. And so without digressing into this much larger conversation about Indian philosophy, what you need to know or to keep in mind is that before the Buddha came along, throughout India, there was a general, again, general understanding that creatures, humans, animals, ghosts, gods, all these different types of sentient beings, that they all have an Atman, like a soul or an essence. And the, the only thing that I want to say about this Atman is that the idea of it is that it's predicated on, it assumes the idea of reincarnation. This idea that, that you've been reborn before many times actually and this is just one of your many multiple rebirths the point of that is in your last life according to this kind of traditional indian view you might have been an animal you might have been a giraffe for example now if you were a giraffe well, you would look you'd look pretty different than you look this time. The point being that even though you might have, or I'll take myself for example, even though I have been born in this kind of body in this life with this color eyes and this color hair and these proclivities, speaking this language, doing these things, that's only the way it appears this time, right? So if this is in an entirely, entirely new vessel, an entirely new vehicle that used to be looking like a giraffe, what, what is, was, is underneath that, that is now Michael, who was a giraffe? What, what is the, that, essence or soul that's cruising through reincarnation that's being reincarnated who's who or what is being reincarnated the atman the soul or the essence says traditional indian philosophy when the buddha comes along and says oh whoa everybody stop the presses there's actually no atman <laughs> The thing about it is, is that if you're like me, I was sort of sort of lukewarm about the Atman to begin with, <laughs> in terms of like, I don't know about reincarnation, I don't know about that whole thing. And so to hear the Buddha say there's no Atman, no soul or essence, again, I wasn't firmly convinced there was one anyways. So it's kind of easy for me personally to be like, okay, cool, <laughs> like, that's, that settles that. My point is, is that in India, at the time of the Buddha, and even to this day, in that sense, the sense of self, the sense of who one is, in an Indian context, it already kind of transcends the physical body, is what I'm getting at. It's a deep part of the culture to already be invested in that, because and this will be important for all of tonight. So much of moral, ethical behavior, so much of spiritual religious practice was about making sure I have a better rebirth. So if all of my daily actions and why I shouldn't, you know, whatever, why I should be a nice person in India, traditionally, people are thinking long term about rebirths in the future. And so the Atman is of utmost importance. And for somebody to come along and say, you know what, everybody, I don't think there is an Atman. In fact, I know there's not one in a way. That is sort of radical in an Indian context. 
So let's keep that in mind that the anatta or anatman, the doctrine of anatta, is about this deeper sense of self, okay, which you may or may not have that sense, of, that deeper sense of self. Let's now get to those two interesting terms that you might not have really heard before. In Pali, the one, the first one I mentioned was sakkaya. In Sanskrit, again, it's satkaya. Basically, that kind of uh, literally etymologically would translate as the true body. Satkaya or sakkaya, the, the real actual true kaya or body. What it is translated to in English, in any Buddhist context, is personality. This is closer to what we're thinking of, I think, when we hear no self. The idea of Michael, like, you know, who I am, Michael, that's more of a personality, that's more of a sakaya. And actually, because I know everybody, at least in the room here, is this our serious Dharma students. I don't know who else will watch this in the future, but because everybody here is a serious Dharma student, I know that you know your five aggregates, you know your five skandhas, the body of form, vedana or sensations, perception, samya, conditioning, samskara, and vijnana, consciousness. These five aggregates are how the Buddha, how Buddhism explains this. It is an aggregation, a coalescing, a coming together of five coalescences. I often like to point this out that each of the five aggregates are themselves aggregations. So it's aggregations upon aggregations in that sense. And what a sakkaya is, is the idea that the five skandhas aggregated together create something more than their parts. It's what we would kind of call a gestalt theory of the self, where it's these five different aspects, consciousness, conditioning, perception, sensations, and a body of physicality but the sakaya is the notion that there's something more there. And that's why they call it the personality in that way. More often than not, sakaya is usually in the conjunction of sakaya dristi or dristi. Or I don't, my Pali, I don't really, I'm not crazy about Pali, but in Sanskrit, it would be the sakaya dristi the view of a personality. And the thing that you should know about the satkaya drishti, the view that there's a self here, technically in the, and remember I'm only talking about the Hinayana, the early path. If you're familiar with that early path, you know, or you might know that that early path is broken into four stages. The, the stage of a stream enterer, a shrotopana, the stage of a once returner, the stage of a non-returner, and then finally, the stage of an arahat, a worthy one. What they say is, or what the, what the, the, what the doctrine is, what the dharma is, is that one who has had a understanding that there is no sakaya, no satkaya, no, nothing more than the skandhas. When one has had that realization, in some traditions, that marks entry into the stream. It's, or it's one aspect of entry into the stream, is this sort of notion or understanding that, oh, that sense of self by which we're referring specifically to a personality, that sense of self, one realizes, ah, that's probably not going on. That's probably not what's going on here. And then that constitutes sort of this uh, stream entry or being a shrotopana. 
let's talk about this Sakaya for a little bit. So a classic way, the reason why I brought up the five aggregates is because a classic way to talk about the, the view of a self, this drishti, is the Buddha often teaches, the Buddha often teaches that you can go, it's like a, it's a way that the Buddha walks students through this teaching of no self. And basically it's walking through each of the five skandhas and asking, is the self in, in there? So let's go through them, have some fun and try to find and try to locate ourself first in the body. So I want to say this really clearly. Right now, I'm not asking you kind of what you are. It's not even about what, and, or, and it's certainly not about, you know, your life's purpose and what you're here to do. So nothing qualitative about this, about you. All we're doing in the first skandha, and if you remember to the first skandha is rupa, the rupa kaya, the body of physical form, the body of flesh, blood, and bone. So the first skandha is about the physical organs, the physical skin, the physical body. And the idea is, is that many of us, like if I were to ask you, like, point, like, where are you? Point to yourself. You may, and now where we would, we'll start to get to it. Okay, where are you? And you may be inclined to say, no, no, no. From, from you know, the tip of each hair all the way to my inner organs, it's this. Okay. Let's think about that. So if you are saying that you are this, and let's say, I'll, I'll play along. Therefore, I, Michael, am this, <laughs> right? So what happens? when I, if I lose my big toe, am I still Michael? Am I still me if I lose my big toe? You might say, yes, but you're Michael without a big toe. Okay, how about all of my toes? Still Michael? Yes, okay, great. So toes are not essential to Michael's being, right? Feet, ankles, Let's go, you, you tell me when I would cease to be Michael then. What, at what point? Arms, right? Well, you know, which, which organ, which organ is essential? Last time I checked, I could get a different heart, different lungs, different this, different that. So, oh, okay, so we're getting close. I'm, I could point to it now, right, Noe? We're getting close to being able to identify where it is. Okay, since we're, we're, zone, we're zoning in on it, right? How big, how big is this self we're talking about? Just, you know, just, you don't have to be exact, but, you know, maybe in grams, maybe in, you could weigh it in grams and just give me a general location of where it is since we we've we've so if you if you're following along of course you're beginning to maybe realize something weird's going on here <laughs> regarding this self and now let me really kind of give you something to think about this whole time that we've been walking through the rupakaya the body of form there's been this funny thing going on, which is this idea of my foot. There's a term, I'm gonna, there's gonna be a lot of technical language tonight because I wanna be really like slick about my, about my presentation here. 
And I want to acquaint you with certain language that you'll come across if you get into this stuff. So the word, the specific word that I want to mention is the word appropriate. We often hear about the idea of misappropriation, like misusing something, but to appropriate something is to make use of something, right? And so even though it's kind of a technical term or a technical word, appropriate, if, if, I, if I had a nail and a two by four and, and there was some hammering that needed to go on and I was like, oh, look, a hammer, perfect. And I used the hammer, right, to put whatever together. You could say I appropriated the hammer. I, I made use of the hammer, right? I appropriated it. It's not ownership, although ownership is kind of a dimension of appropriation, but it's just a kind of a idea of use, right? When we say, or when I say, my foot, it's a, there's an appropriation of the foot there. Who's appropriating? Who's doing the appropriating of this foot? Because we've just, we've, we've established that the foot isn't me or at least it has an ambiguous relationship to me because I don't need it to be me. But now there's this relationship I have with the foot, which is that it's my foot. Again, who's doing the appropriating there of that foot? Let's just leave that kind of hanging out there because even though we might not be able to exactly point to it or weigh it or what have you, you might want to just say, but I can feel it. It's like, it does, I, I know I can't point, but I, I feel that I'm me. So it's a sensation. And this brings us to the second aggregate, Vedana or sensations of the body. So the idea that it's a feeling, oh, okay, it's a feeling, this self, right? Okay, so the way that you feel right now, or the way you feel right now, or the way you felt last week, wait, which, which set particular configuration of sense feelings is this you? And that way of thinking of the self has some pro has similar problems to the one of appropriating the body, which is that if you're kind of identifying or appropriating the body, and then you lose a foot or a hand, and if you were to say, well, now I'm Michael without a foot, if you're willing to accept that rather fluid, changing sense of self, right? I would suggest, log like in terms of my logical presentation here, hold on to that idea of you ever changing. Because now, you know, again, if you lose body parts or gain body, body parts or what have you, there's a morphing or a changing of the physical body. And then again, I would ask, well, at what moment was it you? versus this new you. The same thing takes place with sensations, that it's this idea of at how you feel when. And you might want to say, well, how I feel right now. And that's actually exactly where Buddha Dharma would, would, wants you to go, is to the present moment for some serious analysis, for some serious vipassana. But the, uh, my point is, though, is that if you're kind of now opening up to this idea that you are more fluid than that, things are going to get really fluid. So next up, then, is perception, samya. And there's a lot of different ways that I could talk about this, but I think the, the, the 
most interesting way for tonight in terms of perception is you could think of it as this is the idea of the self as the socially constructed self, as I would say. And this is a series of identifiers that I am, well, I identify with my name, Michael. So it doesn't matter if I lose body parts or gain body parts or this, or whether I'm feeling happy or whether I'm feeling sad or this and this and that, the identifier Michael, that, that's like, I'm Michael. Also my last name, which identifies me with my family. And then there's that, my marital status as a husband, my occupation as a teacher, my sex, my gender, my this, my that, all of these different identifiers. Those could be the self as a perception that I perceive myself as Michael Owens, the husband teacher dude. Now, the problem with, I, with that being the self is what happens when I get a divorce? What happens when I legally change my name? What happens when I no longer am a teacher? What happens when all those socially constructed senses of self begin to change? Who am I in that scenario? If I, if I could stop being the teacher and stop being Michael and stop being all of those things, well, then perception is sort of out because perception and how you perceive yourself are going to be equally shifting and moving and fluid in that way. Everybody doing okay with the first three skandhas? The fourth skandha is conditioning. Samskara, right? Here, I got a girl, I, I, I was thinking about this one of like, well, how could I, you know, break this one down? Here's a really great example. So let's say, um, I want to use a kind of an, a, a, a hypothetical imaginary third person. I know it applies to me. It's just difficult to explain this when I'm referring to myself. So let's say uh, my buddy Steve. Let's say my buddy Steve is um, that you know that body of form, or he thinks he's that body of form, that physical body. Although you know maybe that's changing. My buddy Steve might think he feels like Steve based on those sensations. My, my buddy Steve might think he's Steve, this, you know, he's got a husband or sorry, yeah, he's got a husband, he's got kids, he's got a life, right? What happens when Steve gets into a car accident and gets amnesia? He can't remember that that's his wife. He can't remember that that's, his, you know, he knows, he knows what a hamburger is. He knows up from down, he knows the basics, but in terms of Steve, the husband and his husband and all that, when we say, oh yeah, Steve lost his, his memory, time out, <laughs> who, who lost their memory? Which, how, how is this exactly working? Because the idea would be that, no, no, well, you know, I'm Michael because that's the totality of like my memories, my experiences, my existence. That's who I am. And so if my buddy Steve suffers extreme amnesia and doesn't even know his name anymore, doesn't even know his family situation, is that still Steve? And what sense does it mean? What sense does it make to say, yeah, Steve has amnesia? What's Steve? <laughs> the body? We've already dealt with the body. We've already dealt with the physical body of Steve. So it can't be that that's Steve, meaning the physical body. Sensations can't be Steve. The perception can't be. And now the conditioning has completely changed because he's suffered this a brain trauma in that sense. And so his actual conditioning has been wiped out in that sense. So it can't be conditioning either. Well, now we're finally getting somewhere, right? Fifth skandha, consciousness. 
vijnana. It's got to be there, right, Buddha? <laughs> the self is, if because that's thinking, that's consciousness, that's We've, we've found it, right? We have finally found the self. Well, now we got to get busy. So here's the idea of vijnana. You might not have heard this before, but it's important to understand if you're ever thinking about the skandhas, if you're ever thinking about the aggregates, it's very important to remember that vijnana is not like being conscious, by which I mean, it's not singular. In Buddhism, there are six vijnana, and in some traditions, seven or eight vijnana. The different types of consciousness, by which at this point, I would then really want to not translate vijnana as consciousness, it is always translated as consciousness. And I would continue to do that because I want everybody to know what I'm referring to. But you should know that vijnana is more like awareness. It's kind of more about a kind of awareness. And the word consciousness, it's too strong. The English word consciousness has too much agency to it. And so when you hear about I consciousness, that can sound really weird if you think that the eyeball is thinking. When Buddhism says that there is I consciousness, ear consciousness, nose, tongue, and body consciousness, and then there is a sixth type of vijnana, type of consciousness called manas mind consciousness. Uh, oh, but it, again, I would prefer to translate vijnana as awareness because the point is, is when an eyeball is in contact with light, there emerges or arises in it an awareness of that light. It's not conscious in the way that you and I would think of consciousness, but it is a kind of stimulated awareness in the way that a dead eyeball, meaning an eyeball that doesn't function, you can bounce as much light off of that eyeball as you want, and you're not going to get a response. But when you do get a response and there is an awareness, that's I, kakshir vijnana, that's I awareness. Same thing's going on with the ear that when there's auditory sensation, there arises, emerges auditory awareness, olfactory awareness, gustatory awareness, tactile awareness. And then, and actually before we dive into the, the sixth consciousness, I need to give you a, an image to work with. So, you may remember this one, but if you haven't seen this one, just a quick reminder. This is my needle. It's a stylus of sorts. It's not an actual record needle, but it's big so you can see it. And this is a record. And if as a child, as a kid or whatever, if you've ever done it where you take a needle and run it across and turn the record, and you know what comes out of the end, other end of the needle? Music or whatever is on the record. Everybody familiar with this, at least in the... So as an analogy for vijnana, our eyeballs and our ears and nose and our tongue and our body are like sensors, like needles or like camera sensors, whatever analogy you like. but they are like needles. Sensory objects, light, sound, smells, they're like sense media. When the sense organs come into contact with the sense object, just like music of a record, 
consciousness arises upon the contact between them. And so if this were an opera record, right? My point is, is that when there's contact, there's music. No contact, no music. Vijnana in Buddhism is an emergent phenomena like that music. And when we are in contact, meaning we're seeing stuff or hearing stuff or smelling stuff or tasting stuff or our bodies are in contact with stuff. It's like, ah! <laughs> and we are plugged into the sense media world and awareness arises as a result of that. And what, and I'll give you a great example of it. You ready? If you're watching the screen, Oh, look, you're seeing the record. Oh, now watch. Can you see the record anymore? You can't see it because I severed the contact. So no, you don't see the record. You see me, but we're now in visual contact. Important to keep my music analogy in mind because our five external organs, according to early Buddhism, early Hinayana Buddhism, our external organs are in contact with sense media, and there is emerging or arising this awareness. The brain sits inside as a kind of central processor, but the brain, manas, it doesn't sense light like the eyeballs. It doesn't sense sounds like the ears. Our brains sense dharmas, they are called. But the, what, what these dharmas are that we, our mind is sensing in that way, well, it's twofold, but the way that you can think of it is that when the light hits the eyeball, the music of, 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 of visual awareness arises. And the brain can hear that music. And when it is in contact with the, that, there is a sixth consciousness that emerges. That is called manas. It's a type of awareness. It's a vinyana but it's a music that arises from hearing the other music. That makes sense? Awesome. So manas, the sixth sense organ, the related term to that that I mentioned is just mana. And mana is the third of the terms that I was mentioning tonight, anatta, uh, sakaya, and now this one. Mana is almost always translated as conceit, like being conceited, being arrogant. But the conceit is a specific conceit. And what mana translates to is what is, you will find it in Buddhist literature. It is the conceit of I. That's how it is phrased in Buddhist language. The presumption of a self, the conceit I. That's mana. And you know what mana is in Latin, <laughs> just to have fun? Cogito. And if you have ever heard the famous expression, right? Descartes' famous expression, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. That's the Buddha's big critique, the conceit of I, this idea that because there's thinking going on, I am. Thousands of years after the Buddha, Descartes would make this famous declaration of cogito ergo sum, and the Buddha denied it thousands of years earlier. It's the foundation of the Buddha Dharma, is this conceit of cogito. The point is, is that there is manas, 
like that awareness. And then mana is the idea of I think rather than that there is thinking going on. We're back to the appropriation, but it is not the appropriation of the body. It's the appropriation of thought itself. That's a wild idea. And it's about to get wilder. <laughs> so I hope everybody's with me because I've been kind of laying my breadcrumb trail of ideas here. And so there's one more idea now. So, oh, by the way, mana, the conceit that there's a thinker, that delusion, as it would be called in Buddhism, is what is finally abandoned upon arhatship. So a defining characteristic of an arhat is that the mana, the conceit of I, has been completely abandoned. To be a stream enterer, just a beginner, you have the understanding that there is no sakaya. But the sakaya is this idea of like, again, I put it in terms of um, um, you know, whatever it is, my occupation, all of these different things. And to understand that there is no sakaya is to basically understand that there is no like essential Michael that is this or is that or is, you know, is called this or is called that. So it's more of that socially constructed notion of a self that the stream enterer basically just realizes it's just totally fabricated. And so that self is nowhere to be found, but there is still very much in a stream enterer, the sense that I'm thinking that it's me, that I'm a stream enterer, that I'm, a, you know, that there is a sense that there's a self here thinking, but even that subtle appropriation of thought is abandoned in the arhat. Okay, so that concludes the basic trajectory of the Hinayana regarding no self. We definitely need to, or from that position, attachment to a transmigrating Atman will not, will not suffice in that sense. Attachment to a socially constructed Satkaya will not sort of suffice. And then upon our hardship, you realize, wow, this is a really wild appropriation of thought. The thing about the arhat path, the thing about Hinayana is from a Mahayana point of view and otherwise, it's a very individual process. Meaning the perspective of the Hinayana is that and I've, I've, I say this, I've been saying this a lot. It's a kind of, again, an overgeneralization. But the point of view of the Hinayana is that this is an out of control sensory meat bag. It's a completely out of control sensory meat bag that doesn't know what's going on and, and is really angry about it and is kind of sometimes lashes out violently because of it. But the point, the idea is, is it's that there is a cell, there is a this and a that. There is a sensory meat bag in a world of stuff. And that through the process, the mind of that sensory meat bag gets cleared out and therefore has a much healthier relationship with the world because it's not living in fantasies of a self, not worrying anxiously about a future for that self, not shameful and regretful about the past of a self. So there's a tremendous amount of liberation in the Hinayana. That's why I don't wanna ever make it sound like what I'm about to say is against that. We're just about to go deeper because I'm about to try to explain how the Pratekya Buddha, the solitary enlightened being, thinks about no self. So in order to kind of bring us into the middle period of Buddhism, this sort of, um, well, it's the territory of Buddhas, but 
solitary Buddhas, pratyekya Buddhas. So this is a particular group of enlightened beings. And there's a lot of ways that I could describe what makes a Pratekya Buddha a Pratekya Buddha, what makes a Buddha a Buddha, but I'm gonna give it to you in, in this way. It's, this is a new thing. I have, really haven't ever talked about this, but I think it's really interesting. So we often talk about, or I talk about definitely a lot, the subject and the object, in particular, the subject object relationship. So the, this word subject, you know, the subject, such a, it's a powerful big word subject, right? It's like the topic, the subject of your documentary film, right? What's it about? What's the subject? There's that, there's this idea of the subject versus the object. So this word subject, it has a very, interesting etymology. So the actual meaning of this English word subject is very interesting. So if you don't know where this word comes from, it comes from those two parts of the word. The prefix sub, which is like a submarine underneath, and then the word ject. The word you know, the main word you know is eject, right? To like shoot out, to eject. That's right, the word ject means basically to throw, to toss, to shoot. So what the word subject literally means is that which is underneath upon which everything else is thrown. The subject. So here's the thing about the subject. I'm going to I'm going to use my clock right. So this is now the subject of what I'm talking about right. <laughs> like that's how we would use the word grammatically which is that I have now introduced the clock and I am now going to talk about the clock so that's the subject. So here's the thing about it. It's a red clock right. It's a plastic red clock. It's I mean, as far as clocks go, it's pretty small. So it's a small red and white plastic analog clock, right? The subject, meaning my clock, is what I, what I presume to be there. And then I throw all these characteristics to qualify what type of clock. That it is a clock is not under, we can't talk about that. But that's exactly the, the profound mystery of the subject, which is that it is, there's another English word. I'll give you the etymology of another beautiful English word, presumption. To presume, presumption. The literal etymology of presumption is presupposition. That which occupies the presupposition. Pre meaning it was there when we started the conversation. So we don't actually we we don't deal with that. It was the presumption. So the presumption is that it's a clock. And now we can talk about the qualities of the subject. We can talk about the qualities of the clock, that it's red and white and small and plastic, but, it, but that it's a clock, that's not up for debate. That's the presumption. That's what stands there already at the beginning upon which we throw all the qualifiers. So the big realization of like middle period Buddhism, by which I would basically say this is like Madhyamaka, Nagarjunian emptiness thought, it's the realization that there's no subject.
by which I mean the presumption that it's a clock. How did you know that? How did you already know that it was a clock? Was it maybe because of the qualities? But the qualities, the lakshana, those are the things that we throw on top of the existent, meaning the thing, the subject. And so what the realization is, is that <clears throat> it's kind of about, and it's an extension of this idea of, well, of this idea of the conceit of self, that, that there's somebody there already that's doing the thinking. It's similar to that regarding this, the presumption that it's there already. And then we could talk about that, you know, the presumption, and then that it's Michael, the teacher, da 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 da. da. But there's already been this presumption. So that's a really subtle teaching because at that point we're referring to any and all phenomena as being a presumption as occupying that pre sub position so what happens in the madhyamaka realm but i actually don't want to say that because madhyamaka is not the pratyekya buddha path but the idea is, is that Madhyamaka, Nagarjuna, early Mahayana is really, really focused on the teaching of emptiness, that there is no subject. And I really hope I'm making this clear when I say that there's no subject, by which I'm saying that the clock is a presumption. And so when I say there's no clock, it's about that presumption. That's what's empty. But of course, as soon as we start talking about the color red, that's going to be one of those presumptions, a subject. And so it's empty. And tonight, and I still have plenty of time, but we want to get closer to like, well, let me just say it this way. The Pratekya Buddha is basically someone who has a deep penetrating understanding of the emptiness of all phenomena the no subject of anything. And this leads us to kind of Noe's question from last week, which is if there's no self, no other, and there's not even subjects, meaning clocks and stuff, <laughs> where does that leave us? And indeed, that's one of the ideas is that some people historically seem to have figured this out, meaning the emptiness of all phenomena, and it seems to have driven them into a very, very, very still state of, I don't want to say apathy, but it sounds from the descriptions like apathy, where it's, there's just nothing to do. There's nothing to do, no one to do it, no one to tell about not doing anything and so the Pratekya Buddha is called a solitary Buddha because it's like they're, they're alone in their own little enlightened world. Now, because I want to really say a few things, like there's few, I have more to say. The Mahayana, the Bodhisattva path comes along and it's in many ways a response to the Hinayana, which was focused solely on the individual and the Pratekya Buddha, who was sort of lost in emptiness, right? Very wise, these Pratekya Buddhas, because they really understand what's going on. But it's sort of the question of, well, now what? That is the problem. But here's the real, the real thing. When I mentioned stream entry in the Hinayana, in the early path, and the idea that if you figure out that there's no Sakaya in that gestalt way, that's called attaining stream entry. 
And then when one figures out this conceit of self and that there's no mana, there's just manas, there's just mind function, one attains arhatship. And when one figures out emptiness, one attains this pratikya buddha, this buddhahood of that being. The thing about it is, and I'm going to unpack this more, but I just want to make sure I say this. From the bodhisattva point of view, practicing Mahayana, they say this, attain? Who attains? Didn't he say there's no self? So what's all this business about attaining anything? Who? What are you? It sounds to me like if you claim attaining anything, you're demonstrating your delusion of self. It doesn't actually sound like you're attaining these states of no self. Now, it's a critique. And in fact, if you read the Heart Sutra, so the Pranyaparamita Heart Sutra, foundational Bodhisattva text, if you read it very carefully, it talks a lot about attainments. And in fact, it talks a lot about how the Bodhisattva makes no attainments. And that's a statement about how the Bodhisattva is doing like real no self stuff. These people over here talking about, hey, last week I attained our hardship or whatever. It's, it's, it's actually, it sounds as dumb as it is in this way of I attained our hardship. Really? So yes, the Mahayana and the Bodhisattva path looks at the Hinayana and looks at the Pratekya Buddha and is basically like, you know, if you're claiming to have gotten anywhere or claiming these attainments, it doesn't sound like you really understood what the Buddha was talking about. Now I'm going to unpack this more and really kind of make it clear about why like that Make, it's not just a critique finger pointing, like it's actual dharmically makes a lot of sense. So another, now that we're in deep Mahayana, like Bodhisattva Mahayana, not the early emptiness stuff, but the real Bodhisattva path, I had got some more philosophy to talk to you about. So this last piece of philosophy that we need to talk about is what would be called phenomenalism. I mention it often at Sunday Night Dharma Doors, and phenomenalism becomes a discipline known as phenomenology. And we need to talk about phenomenology a little bit. So what phenomenology says, and I'm going to give you the quick genealogy of like Western European phenomenalism and phenomenology so that we can understand the, this Buddhism a little bit better. So again, this isn't Buddhism right now. It's just defining this phenomenalism. Western European phenomenalism does sort of begin in a Hinayana way where they presume the subject. So the presupposition of the subject, right? But what phenomenology is basically about is this. Remember my record analogy? So the thing about it is, is that when the record needle, whether it's the eye or the ear, or the nose or whatever, it comes into contact with the sense object. And then you know what happens? The music comes out of here. Now, what happens when this is slightly damaged and the music that comes out of this end is distorted, right? So the idea here is, is that some data might be coming into my eyeball, but depending upon my particular sets of rods and cones in my eye, the data, the, the light, will be processed a certain way. And therefore the music, the awareness that arises in this eyeball 
it's going to be unique to this eyeball. Meaning that if I'm colorblind, then what I see is going to be representative of my sensory organ defect or what have you. Same thing with the ears, same thing with the nose, tongue, and body. So now I have these five potentially flawed, probably flawed, definitely unique. I have these five unique sensors that are processing data and based upon their unique makeup are giving rise to unique specific Michael phenomena. And then my brain, the sixth sense organ, which is also vastly conditioned, vastly distorting, unique to Michael, takes the already distorted images, distorts them even further through the process of that. And that's what we think about all day, distortions upon distortions. Now, the technical words for these distortions that I'm describing are phenomena or that idea of, well, the, another word that the phenomenologists use is impressions. So the idea again is that, well, I'm actually gonna give it to you even a little deeper. So the Buddha often uses a really, really nice example to describe phenomenology, phenomenalism. And in fact, this is gonna go even deeper than European Western phenomenology. And again, this was probably around 500 BC when the Buddha outlined this. The analogy the Buddha gives is he says, it's like someone who has a cataract. Now, if you don't know what a cataract is, just imagine that you have a grease, you have a greasy finger and you rub your eye and it gets a smudge of grease on your eye. Okay. The Buddha calls, uses the example of a cataract, but if you're not old enough, you might not know about cataracts. So the idea is, is that this person who has this smudge on their eye or this cataract on their eye, when they look at the light, they look at a light source, they see a flower dancing in the air. And that flower, right, is kind of, well, it's a kind of illusion. It's a kind of mirage because what the flower is, is it's like ref refracted light, right? So the light is being refracted and create, creating this kind of magic, colorful swirl that looks like a flower. Now, what the Buddha says is, is, is that flower really in the air in front of the person? Like, does it actually exist outside of them as an object? And of course, the idea is, well, what the Buddha says is, there's somebody standing next to this person that doesn't have a cataract. And they're saying, what flower? I don't, I don't see the flower. So is the flower really floating in the air? No. Oh, so the flower is in that guy's eye, right? Because it's not out in the air, so it has to be in his eye. But then what the Buddha says is, but then why is it when the guy turns his head away from the light, he can't see the flower anymore? If it were in his eyeball, he'd be able to see it everywhere. Oh, so it's not inside his eye either, right? So is it in some kind of in-between space? This is what the Buddha always says. So if it's not outside and it's not inside, oh, so it's in some kind of in-between space. Where, where exactly is that, right? The realization is that the flower is a dependently originated phenomena. And what we would say in the Buddhist tradition is that it is such, it is so. And to say that the flower is such means that the person is experiencing it. And there's no denying that they're experiencing it. But once we start arguing about the reality or irreality of the flower, we are now 
we've missed it. We've missed the nature of the flower if we are arguing about whether it exists or it doesn't exist, whether it's a real flower or not a real flower. N now, real flower or not a real flower? My point is, is that everything I just said about the mirage flower is true of this flower as well. But I know this one might seem like it has some sort of more reality to it. But of course, what's wonderful, it, it's one wonderful thing about this Zoom technology world. You do all know that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people potentially seeing seven different flowers because they have seven different laptops, right? So where is my flower? And, you know, where's the real flower in that way? The point is, is that even if I keep saying this flower, which one am I referring to? The one on your laptop screen or the one in my hand? The, and I kind of have a few more things to say, so I just kind of want to demystify that a little bit. The idea is, is that when we're locked into ideas of real and false, we start searching then to find the real one and dispense with the phenomenal or dispense with the fake ones. And what phenomenology or phenomenalism or this kind of Buddhism is, is talking about is that there isn't a real one, but there is suchness in that regard. So now I want to make this even more complicated than it already is to give Noe the best answer that I, I could give him for this. So the sutra that we're reading that I read at the beginning said that the Bodhisattva does not encourage the Hinayana path. And the idea of that is, is that the Bodhisattva sees that it's a little short-sighted because it's only focused on the individual. The Bodhisattva sees the shortcomings of the emptiness path of the Pratekya Buddha for similar reasons, but it's mainly about this idea of sitting alone, claiming you've attained something. <laughs> Your attainments are relative to people who haven't made attainments, and therefore you're still stuck in duality. You're not anywhere near emptiness, dude. That's the idea. So now, to tie together a lot of the ideas that we just talked about tonight. No self, I tried to dismantle it every way possible, right? The physical body, sensations, perception, conditioning, consciousness, where is the self in any of that? And the first step is that we do need to divest ourselves of the conceit of self and i as i often say i almost say this almost every sunday night if there was a self and the buddha was saying yeah and don't get attached to it it's better if you're not attached to it it's more virtuous if you're not attached to it that would be a form of repression self-control where there is a self but you're being advised to not get too attached to it. Buddha Dharma is just, there isn't a self. And if you think about it as we did tonight, very carefully, you will kind of just really realize there's not the, there's not the thing that I'm presuming in that way. So that is not a repression. It's wisdom. And, and again, the Buddha wouldn't really want you to have it any other way in that sense. Like it's either through wisdom or not. So my point is, is that we divest ourselves of that conceit of self, but there's still something going on here, even for the Arhat, even for the Pratekya Buddha, even for the Buddha, there's something going on here, right? And so what the Bodhisattva understands is this. 
because they've realized that there's no self between the ears and behind the eyes and the identifying with occupation and name is not self they begin to understand the bodhisattva begins to understand that well let's see i have the time so i'm going to use an example an example is actually um it's it's just easier this way but it's about being in a relationship it's about being a buddhist and being in a relationship like i said i'm married i'm in a relationship and so how does a buddhist practitioner like michael who's deep in this study of no self how how do i be in a relationship in that sense well having kind of understood what i've understood about this all of this i recognize that my partner and i my wife and i are involved in kind of co-creating ourselves and what i mean by that is is that you have to understand that and i probably should have mentioned this earlier or said more about it but when we other we self when we say hey you hi you meaning not me <laughs> hi not me so every time we other meaning we we say hi to somebody we are simultaneously selfing so understanding that that's what's happening in any relationship that there's a co-creation of self and other going on the idea is is that if you understand that then you recognize oh yeah the self isn't between the ears and behind the eyes the self isn't between her eyes and or behind her eyes and behind her ears it's the selves that, a there's no selves but the degree to which there are selves they're bound up together and so and you can appreciate this again from a microcosmic scale of your own household if you are in a relationship but the bodhisattva recognizes i recognize that in terms of enlightenment i'm not going anywhere without her and and i mean that in terms of like we're bound up in this together and you can think of that practically in terms of if i'm angry all the time she's going to be affected by that and her cultivation and development is going to be stymied in that sense likewise i could be as pieced out as 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 it I, as it gets but if she's angry the idea is is that if we're working on it kind of together then both no selves are moving towards enlightenment if that makes sense and if it does then you can apply your kantian maxim which is that to make that a universal law which is that you recognize oh my enlightenment is actually bound up in all sentient beings enlightenment and here's the thing i got to say this cuz i i kind of have i feel that it's already out there remember when i was talking about my phenomenal flower and i was talking about how these eyes these ears this nose this tongue creates a unique special version of the flower right and that flower doesn't exist anywhere else but in my experience if you understand that teaching of phenomenalism regarding stuff when you apply it to others things get really wild and what i mean by that is is and i've used and i i apologize for bouncing all over with my analogies it's just i choose whichever one feels the most appropriate but i've used this one a lot in the a few nights ago and it's the idea of my father and what i have come to a realization of through my practice is that this person that i call my father that if you were to ask me like who's your dad 
the, the, the image that comes to my mind when you ask me that, right? That's my father, that guy, right? The realization is though, my mother doesn't see that person the way I do at all. She met him, you know, when he was this young guy in the Air Force. And I'm sure she always sees that same young guy in the Air Force, right? Even though he's older and all of that. But her Howard, his name is Howard. So her Howard and mine are two entirely different entities. And never shall the twain meet. My mother's Howard and my Howard, they actually never meet. And then, of course, there's always that person, Howard, his self-reflexive understanding of that body he's appropriating, which is his own Howard. That's totally different than mine and totally different than my mother's. The point is, is this. Understanding that phenomenology, the phenomenalism of others, what I've realized and put into practice is, oh, so if I get angry at my father, I'm only angry at that special Michael version of my father. And if you, it's, this isn't literal, but hypothetically, you can think of that, that one, that guy, that Howard, as kind of like 50% Michael, 50% Howard, like, you know, the real Howard. Now that's not right because it's 100% Michael because it's my mind, my impressions. So now if the Bodhisattva really understands that, what happens when the Bodhisattva is angry at anybody or anything. They recognize they're just being angry at themselves. Or at the very least, they understand they're just sitting there being alone and angry. And there is no efficacy in it. There's no, it's just, if, you, if that's what you wanna do, if that's what you wanna do is sit around being angry, but just recognize you're just sitting there alone being angry. And what I mean by that is, is that the anger will never get to the person you want it to get to because you, you will always just be aiming it at your impression of them. And it's the wild thing about phenomenology. Your anger can never actually get out to them, at least to the them them, if that makes sense. So once again, the bodhisattva path is a path of wisdom, not repression. One doesn't repress anger. There's a, one controls anger, <laughs> please control your anger. But the idea is, is that the, the bodhisattva doesn't get angry. And I don't want to say that the bodhisattva gets angry. But the point is, is that the bodhisattva is working on it from this wisdom point of view not from a self-control, like bad Michael, you got angry today, try to do better tomorrow. It's more about, oh, I forgot things are empty again. Oh, I, th I forgot things are phenomenological impressions again. So that's, that's the idea. <laughs> okay, um, so at the end, Noe, my big sales pitch for the Bodhisattva path is basically about this kind of understanding that the Bodhisattva has that the real awakening, the real enlightenment is only achieved together in that sense. It's the only way it can happen. So from that Bodhisattva point of view. All right, everybody, we did it again. We made it through a little bit of the sutra learned a lot about no self questions comments answers ideas epiphanies realizations a couple of them came up for me but they were earlier on and so i just wanted to bring them up uh, you know the, 
your original face. Remember that concept, well, what is your original face? And you've covered a lot, made a lot of sense to me. So thank you in an understanding of that wisdom. And, uh, and also the, the, something that came up, the hammer striking, the hammer striking stillness. <laughs> Started to think about that, and then the one that came up for me is the the media, uh, hmm. the media in my head, the media which you covered also that I am creating this media. But thank you so much with your wisdom. I forgot. <laughs> All right, everybody.